Next on NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. We'll discuss news out of Japan that could have a significant impact on U.S. beef exports. Plus, we'll have the latest on the fight against the waters of the U.S. rule and what this could mean to the beef industry. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen with host Kevin Oxner. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Oxner. Thanks for joining us. In industry news, there are new measures in place that will hurt the access of U.S. beef to Japan, which is still our top export market. Exports of frozen U.S. beef were so high during the first quarter of Japan's fiscal year that it triggered a safeguard mechanism to increase tariff rates from 38.5% to 50%. This is significant because U.S. beef now faces an even wider tariff disadvantage compared to Australia, which is a free trade agreement with Japan. NCBA continues to encourage the Trump administration to negotiate our own trade agreement with Japan to help level that playing field. We have to start a bilateral talks with Japan, our number one trading partner for U.S. beef. It's a multi-billion dollar market for us, and uh, because the Trump administration withdrew us from the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Agreement, now we have to start bilateral talks with Japan to try to improve our access into Japan, even though it's our number one market, the Australians are fierce competitors and they have a huge tariff advantage against us right now. And so we got to get to work and try to lower our tariffs into Japan and, and increase our access to compete with Australians. We've also seen developments uh, with the European Union in Japan signing a free trade agreement. And unfortunately, from the U.S. walking away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, we would have seen our tariff rate go from 38.5% to 9% over 16 years. And those are the same terms that the Europeans are receiving from the Japanese. So not only are we going to be further behind the Australians, we're also going to be behind the Europeans in Japan. That's not good news for U.S. producers. And that's why it's very important that the United States prioritize trade with Japan. For years, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association has been leading the charge against the waters of the United States, or WOTUS. Here to talk more about this important topic is Scott Yeager, NCBA's Environmental Counsel. Thanks for joining us, Scott. Thanks for having me, Kevin. Can you give us an update on where we currently stand with the waters of the U.S. rule? So where we currently stand with the waters of the U.S. rule is that this has been a priority issue for NCBA for the past five or six years, I'd say, and we've been strongly opposed to it and trying to get it fixed. So we've taken a three-pronged approach to that, uh, fighting it through the courts by suing the agencies to get that fixed, um, taking it to Congress to see if Congress can get it fixed through the, the legislative process, as well as going straight to the agencies to see what help they can provide here. And where each of those stand is, uh, on the court front, we have our lawsuit going to the Supreme Court in October, on, con on the congressional front, we have Congress uh, working through the appropriations process right now, and one of the provisions in the EPA and Army Corps appropriations budget is a language that would allow the EPA and Army Corps to repeal the 2015 WOTUS rule uh, without getting bogged down in activist litigation. And then lastly, but most importantly, uh, the path to victory here is through the agencies and through EPA and the Army Corps uh, going through their regulatory process to actually repeal the 2015 WOTUS rule and to replace it with a narrower definition. Remind our viewers of the risk this rule would pose to cattlemen and women all across our country. That's a great question, Kevin, and the risk that this 2015 Obama-era WOTUS rule would pose to cattle producers that uh, when you think about what WOTUS is, it means waters of the U.S. and it is essentially the jurisdictional element of the Clean Water Act. And uh, the 2015 rule was a vast overreach of jurisdiction on a monumental scale. So virtually all water bodies across the country, regardless of how much water flows through them or how kind of attenuated they are from a navigable water, 
would presumably fall under the 2015 rules definition of a federal water. And what that means for a cattle producer is you now have the EPA and the Army Corps sniff around in your backyard on your pastures on your rangeland because they are now jurisdictional waters under their purview and you might have to get a permit for what you're doing on your land. Now we recently saw Environmental Protection Agency Administrator Scott Pruitt visit a ranch right here in Colorado. Can you talk about the significance of that visit? So EPA Administrator Scott Pruitt came out to Last Chance Colorado and visited with Mark Frazier and the Fraser Ranch as well as a number of other stakeholders including Ag uh, County Commissioners and Ag Commissioner of Colorado and other people who wanted to weigh in with Mr. Pruitt on some of EPA's policies and, and paths forward. And one issue of relevance here is the WOTUS rule and he took comments and suggestions from all the people in the room including the ranchers. Uh, there was a strong contingent of cattle producers there uh, and, and Mr. Pruitt listened to them and, and wrote down notes and, and, and was by all means engaged, very well engaged. And, that is a product of uh, the EPA actually reaching out to NCBA to find a ranch out near Denver to go visit with and to uh, kind of hear from cattle producers about the WOTUS rule and what they want to see in a replacement and, and repeal. The cattle industry's relationship with the EPA has often been challenging. How refreshing is it to have an administrator that actually wants to hear from ranchers? It's extremely refreshing to have an EPA administrator that actually does want to hear from cattle producers and wants to get out to rural America and hear what stakeholders have to say. So that is extremely refreshing and it's a really good sign that we have someone in the EPA that is actually willing to listen. And that's a big change from back in 2015, where if you recall, uh, EPA under the Obama administration touted the fact that they had over 400 meetings on their rollout of the 2015 WOTUS rule. And in fact, EPA officials went out to Fraser Ranch in Colorado back before their 2015 rollout. Um, so that's kind of an interesting wrinkle here is that the difference between the two administrations and their willingness to kind of hear us out and actually have a substantive conversation uh, with ears wide open I think that's very much is what is happening now with the administrator Pruitt versus uh, what didn't happen before under the Obama administration. Well, thanks again for joining us, Scott. Thank you. If you'd like to support the beef industry, why not become an NCBA member? By doing so, you'll be sustaining the work of NCBA in defending and advocating for cattle producing families just like yours. There's strength in numbers, so to join up, just call toll free. 1-866-USA-BEEF or you can visit the website beefusa.org. Up next on Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll examine some of the issues that public lands ranchers deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And later, we'll take you to an award-winning family ranch right here in Colorado. We'll be right back. No matter what job I've got to do, my John Deere 5 e tractor can do it all. Whether I'm cutting, moving feed, or building a fence. Using my 5 e means my work gets done faster at a price I can afford, and that works for me. Hey everybody, I'm Stormy Warren from Sirius XM's The Highway. Join me for the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Phoenix, January 31st through February 2nd. You can find out more at beefusa.org. Welcome back. For years, the National Cattlemen's Beef Association and the Public Lands Council have advocated on behalf of those ranchers that hold public lands grazing permits. Russell Nemitz caught up to Ethan Lane, executive director of the PLC and NCBA Federal Lands, to get his thoughts on the challenges and opportunities facing these ranchers. 
Kevin, those federal land ranchers out there play a significant role in the U.S. beef cattle industry. And with us today to talk about some of those key issues impacting federal land ranchers across America is Ethan Lane, the executive director of the Public Lands Council and NCBA Federal Lands. Um, Ethan, maybe walk us through some of those issues that federal land ranchers are dealing with these days that maybe those non-federal land ranchers don't have to worry about so much. Sure. Well, obviously, at the top of that list is the permitting process. If you own your ranch, it's deeded property. For the most part, you can do what you need to do there. Obviously, we wrestle with challenges with clean water and other things across the country with ranchers operating on private land. But when you introduce multiple government agencies having a real say in how you run your business on a day-to-day -day basis, it changes the game significantly. So what we really spend our time with in the West is making sure to clear those roadblocks to rightful renewals of those permits. These ranchers have had these, these federal land permits in their families sometimes for generations. They've been stewards of this land. They've cared for these resources. The wildlife populations we see on these ranches are there because of the good work our members do taking care of those landscapes. So what we really spend most of our time doing is blocking and tackling to make sure that federal overregulation or litigious environmental groups or others that really don't want to see the cattle industry succeed on these landscapes are kept at bay so that ranchers can do what they do best, which is take care of the land and, and produce good high quality beef. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes that task is easier said than done. That's why it's so important to have the PLC and NCBA working every single day on these issues back in Washington, D.C. You know, walk us through some of those other issues that are affecting those public land ranchers today. You know, at the top of the list is the Endangered Species Act. Obviously, we have problems with the Endangered Species Act across the country, but it really is intensified in the West because of that federal, heavy federal footprint. So what we see time and again are these hundreds of species. We're at about 2,000 species listed on the Endangered Species Act today. About 1,000 of those are here in the United States. And most of those are sort of species that are that are petitioned by these environmental groups as sort of weapons to target and shut down operations on federal lands. So whether we're talking about the wolf, the grizzly bear, the greater sage grouse, the lesser prairie chicken, the, the previous jumping mouse, I mean, you, the list goes on and on, and we're looking down the road towards species like the monarch butterfly. Every one of these has the potential to totally derail operations in different parts of the country. Or in these, like these big species like the monarch, we're talking about most of the middle of the country. So it's critical that we make some modernization to the Endangered Species Act that, that absolutely changes the way that it's working right now. Right now it's totally focused on that listing process because that's where the litigants from the environmental community have focused all of their effort. We want to change that paradigm so that the focus is really on recovering species that need the help and processing them off that list, delisting them and returning them to state management where they belong. That way those resources at the federal level can be focused on species that actually need the help. So we're sort of trying to de-weaponize the Endangered Species Act and make it work sort of the way the American people already think that it does. What about the issue of wildfire and wildfire control, not just on our federal lands, but also the non-federal lands out there? Because it's another big topic that PLC and NCBA work on every single year. Well, and these issues go hand in hand. You know, when you have ranchers removed from these landscapes or when their stocking rates are cut because of an Endangered Species Act listing or something else, you get less of that reduction in fuel loads from cattle going out on those landscapes and keeping those, those fuel loads in check. The result of that, especially coming out of a wet winter like we had last winter and a hot, dry summer, is catastrophic wildfire. And that catastrophic wildfire threat is detrimental not just to the, the rancher's ability to use that forage, it's detrimental to the species that are on that landscape. And if you get into a fire cycle like we see in some parts of the country where it burns, it grows back with invasive weeds, it burns again hot and fast, it depletes the nutrients in the soil, and what we get year over year is a lack of real production moving forward. And everybody loses when that happens. So it's critically important that not only we get ranchers out on that landscape grazing early and often to keep those fuel loads in check, but that they're really sort of kept in the process because they know how those resources need to be cared for and the agencies need to be integrating them into those conversations to make sure their input's heard. What about this new grazing tool I've been hearing about? 
Well, I mean, it, the tool just is grazing. I mean, it's, it's, it's pretty uncomplicated, to be honest with you. We were in parts of Idaho back in the spring, right out of, that, out of that wet season, and we were looking at grass that was up to our knees in some areas. And the BLM that was out on the ground with us looked at those, at those resources, and they said, you know, we could use thousands more cattle out here than we have, but our hands are tied by the permitting restrictions that we have in place right now. We need the flexibility to open these gates and let ranchers bring more cattle in to bring these fuel loads down. And uh, the only way to do that is to work with Congress and build some flexibility into the laws so that ranchers have the ability to do what they know they need to do and what they're already able to do on their private land. Hey, Ethan, let's talk about the relationship between the PLC and the NCBA and the Bureau of Land Management now. You know, the Bureau of Land Management is such a huge part of what we do in the West, and obviously it's a relationship that's fraught on occasion. Um, I, you know, we have a lot of ranchers that are always frustrated with the BLM. I'm usually frustrated with at least part of the BLM. Um, in this new administration, we've really kind of given, given, been given a fresh start. Um, we have new staff coming in. We have old staff that, if I'm being honest, almost seem like a weight's been lifted from their shoulders. They feel more free now to talk about some of the solutions that I think privately they've been willing to acknowledge are out there for quite some time. That's giving us an opportunity to revisit issues like wild horse management, to revisit some of these sage grouse resource management plans that were, uh, that were published back in 2015 that have so heavily impacted ranchers across the West, um, and also revisit just how grazing is used and how ranchers are used as management tools for those resources in the West. I mean, we know when BLM has a, an ungrazed acre, it costs them about $5 to manage. If we put a rancher on that same landscape, the, the cost drops to $2 an acre. So we are an essential part of their management structure. We just have to help them understand how to streamline that process so that they can take full advantage of that. And we think we've got an audience now in, in, at the current BLM with Secretary Zinke at Interior and, and uh, uh, with the new BLM director to really work through that process and, and uh, kind of set ourselves up for the next 30 years. Yeah, I just kind of wanted to wrap up with that. It seems like there is a, a ton of common sense, if you will, back in the, the Interior Department. And it's been fun to have Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke, a Westerner out of the state of Montana, kind of uh, heading up things. You know, it's, it's kind of fun to have Ryan. I mean, Ryan was always a great member of Congress when we were on the Hill, when he was a, a, a member from Montana. We always had a great relationship with him. Walking into Interior now and seeing him and having him smile at us and know who we are and be excited to see us is a complete game changer. Um, it just makes it fun to go to Interior now, and, uh, you know, I think that's been infectious. Uh, his staff that he's brought into place are the same way, and it just changes the game completely and how we deal with the agency. Well, we certainly appreciate you joining us on the program today, Ethan. Appreciate you having me. All right, Kevin, as always, a ton of issues going on that are affecting our federal land ranchers out there, but it's also fun to be able to talk about all the good things that those federal land ranchers are doing for the environment on those federal lands. With that, we'll go ahead and send it back to you. We all know accurate production records are essential if an operation wants to maximize its profitability. That's why for more than 30 years, Producers have trusted NCBA's Red Book to help them keep better records. The 2018 Red Books are on sale starting October 8th, and you can even customize yours with a company name or logo on orders of 100 or more. Just visit the website beefusa.org or call 1-800-525-3085 to place your order. Still to come on Cattleman to Cattleman, we'll show you a family ranch in Colorado that's improving the land for future generations. And later, expert advice on building a conservation plan to help control invasive species. Stay with us, we'll be right back. There is a new world out there, revealing itself in unpredictable ways. A world that demands more from the land and those who grow, farm, and build on it. This new world calls for the ingenuity to get more out of it while preserving as much as we can. After all, to stay ahead of tomorrow, we need to be equipped for it today. Stay Tough Fence will last three times longer and is four times stronger than low tensile fencing. High tensile wire, solid vertical stays, and tight fixed knots all provide superior strength. You will use fewer posts, saving time, labor, and money. 
protect your investment for generations with Stay Tough Fence. Stay strong. Stay tight. Stay tough. Welcome back. Every day, cattlemen and women care for their land and their animals because they're committed to leaving what they have in better shape for the next generation. We're highlighting the 2017 regional winners of the Environmental Stewardship Award. Let's take a closer look at the winning operation from Region 5 right here in Colorado. On the Flying Diamond Ranch in eastern Colorado, the Johnson family rides out, gathers cows and calves, and then works together to get the branding done. It's a family tradition that goes back more than a century. Our family's been here for 110 years in eastern Colorado. My great-grandfather trailed cattle through here in the 1800s. Uh, he was a Kansas rancher and a uh, bank had foreclosed on the original place out here. Asked my great-grandfather to come out and manage the ranch. He did that for a year or two and then assumed the loan and uh, we've been here for 110 years. Charles Collins later served as the national president of the Cattlemen's Association. The ranch he started is led today by his great-grandson Scott Johnson and his wife Jean with the active help and ownership of their four kids and their families. The operations expanded here recently as my siblings and myself have, you know, kind of grown up. So the operation has expanded in the last, you know, five years. And now we have, you know, not only this place here in Cheyenne County, but uh, multiple other um, leases and ranches around the state and region. We're now on about 50,000 acres, 25,000 deeded. The Johnson family runs about a thousand composite breed cows on the short grass and sand sage prairie of eastern Colorado. Back in 1990, Scott Johnson adopted a holistic approach to managing the ranch. It's cattle, ranch, and family, I see it all. And uh, you know, we can't be real s strong in one, one area and weak in another. We see it all as one whole, and we try to balance the whole deal. You know, you're always wondering, what can we do better? In any business, I think if you fall asleep and start thinking everything's wonderful, you're gonna, you could lose it. So we're all of us thinking, you know, what can we do to improve? One major improvement Scott made was moving to a high density, low frequency grazing system. The Johnsons added over a hundred miles of fencing to divide their pastures. Now the grasslands are used more fully and yet are rested more than 95% of the time. We think this grazing is a real plus to us. Uh, it used to be we'd have cattle, could be in 3,000 acres. Now a bunch is in a, a tenth of that, 320 acres. From herd impact and you know giving long recovery periods, I think you truly do increase the productivity of your ground. So not only are you utilizing more, but you're increasing productivity. So now we're getting more pounds off the acres. Now we're getting into something that uh, you know has an economical benefit to us. And we're getting that economical benefit by doing ecological things that are improving the rangeland. I think the biggest thing is just that rest you're giving it. So, you know, a, a piece of ground's not getting grazed for 355 days or 360 days. And that allows it, you know, to revitalize quicker and uh, better, um, especially in those years of drought that we've had. God put grasslands around here and cattle, they're very happy on grasslands. That's where they're supposed to be. So, I mean, I stand firmly that cattle ranching is absolutely good for this environment. With average precipitation of just 13 inches per year, the Johnsons have an overall goal of working with nature. They've adjusted their calving season to better fit their available forage and established key grazing areas to closely monitor grazing impact. They've also limited cattle access to riparian areas and created wide buffer zones to restore and protect the creeks that cross their lands. And they've installed more than 20 miles of pipeline to provide fresh water at the center of each grazing cell. You know, to put the grazing system in place, we had to put a lot of water in place and pipe a lot of water so that we could set up kind of the cells center wagon wheel system. I think that allows dispersal across the ranch of our grazing and 
for some wildlife. Put it all together and it's clear. At the Flying Diamond Ranch, they understand how healthy cattle and healthy rangelands work together. And the Johnson family is always thinking ahead to the future generations that will one day live and work on this land. You know, my family all along has understood that what we really have out here, what we've been entrusted with is the natural resources. You know, it's pretty special and if you work with it and you listen to it and you do what's in its best interest, it'll take care of you. It's taken care of us for 110 years. If we want this to continue for multiple more generations, the, the greatest asset is the land. You know, you gotta take care of the land, you gotta be good to the land. It really does come down to a mindset of this ranch is not for me. This ranch is for all of us and for the next generation. So it's a, it's a big responsibility. It means everything to me. You know, as the mother, you know, I see such a value in, in our way of life, our culture. And it's something, you know, that each generation has built upon and given to the next. And that's so special. You know, I'm a family guy, and uh, to me, I am proudest of our four kids and their four spouses in the next generation, and I just think we're gonna do a good job out here, environmentally speaking, in, in the future. I think we're well prepared and well positioned to do things right. If you'd like to find out more about the Environmental Stewardship Award winners, see photos and videos from their operations, or even learn how to nominate someone for the award, just visit environmentalstewardship.org. Still to come on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, we'll head to Utah to see how one ranch is working with NRCS to help improve its rangelands. And later, we'll discuss some of the highlights for the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA trade show. Don't go away, we'll be right back. What does it mean to be an American cattleman? It means you have what it takes where it counts, on the inside. At Ritchie, we understand that. It's what's on the inside that defines us. We share the same values, ingenuity, commitment, sense of pride. These are the values that built this country. They're the values that built this company. Ritchie, proud to be a partner to the American cattlemen since 1921. Long live the courageous, the tenacious, the ones who push forward and give back. Long live the greater good, the helping hand, and long live the truck built to outlast them all. Ram, America's longest lasting pickups. Welcome back. Farmers and ranchers know that conservation practices can improve land and resources. But it's important to remember that conservation planning can also help recover land that's being threatened by invasive species. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter takes us to a Utah ranch whose partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or NRCS, helped improve their rangeland resources. Just outside Utah's Zion National Park, brothers Eric and Klein Esplin are carrying on the family heritage of ranching in the rugged environment of Mount Carmel. My grandpa, Rollin, had his homestead, um, originally homesteaded here, and my grandpa be, was pretty aggressive in his day, and he's put together pretty much the nucleus of what we have today. There's lots of challenges with, with uh, cattle ranching in Mount Carmel. Uh, Mount Carmel is in the southwest part of the state. Very popular area as far as people coming to visit it, but that also is a challenge. We're in a 12-inch precip zone, very rugged country, and I'm very proud that we're able to harvest and put this, this arid land into production. In this country, water is what controls everything and then having feed near the water. The challenge was developing better grass species near the water and developing the waters, getting that 
piped into areas that would support cattle. Growing feed near water was especially challenging for the Esplins due to invasive trees that were overtaking their grazing lands. They looked to their local NRCS field office for help in developing a conservation plan that would help reclaim their pastures. These pinion and juniper are very invasive. I mean, they'll, as you can, as you'll notice behind me, there's one little or two little trees right there that are trying to that are growing and before long there'll be three or four and then four or five and maybe a few more. They can just crowd out anything, any vegetation, any grass. And so it's really kind of a challenge to control them just to give our grass a chance, grass and other species a chance, but they're very aggressive. We started with the Esplins over 20 years ago, I believe, in our conservation planning. So we first figured out um, what are your objectives for this land? They had some really invading juniper, which creates um, this bare ground, sheet and rail erosion, and what can we do about that? What, how can we help them? What kind of planting and seeding for range um, should, should we do? Recommending those things that would be viable um, for a very long period of time to help uh, treat the land and heal the land. Once a plan is in place, it just really helps us because we have expertise is brought in that we don't have access to, uh, just left to our own devices. And they're able to help us to know what sort of treatments are available, what sort of things had ought to be done. And then we can, we can just bring a number of partners to the table that all want to benefit from this, this type of a treatment. And so we're able to all coordinate on what uh, the desired goal is. So all of that put together moves us forward in, in getting these, these things on the ground and, and established. With a plan in place, the Esplins quickly began to see many improvements in the overall ecological balance of their rangelands. The short term, um, it's been really interesting to see just even after a year. It was very nice to see that you indeed have these grasses coming in, uh, crested wheatgrass, the intermediate wheatgrass, as well as a bit of clover and other uh, legumes, which are really important part of the diversity in the mix. And then um, right here around me, um, it's been about, I think, a 10-year treatment, and you can see everything popping back. And actually, the diversity here is quite great. Um, you also see natives coming back. You've got some of the native brush, um, which is still okay for great forage and a, a great working ranch. Once you can get, remove those trees, it is just amazing the amount of uh, production that, that you can can get from those areas. Once those trees are gone, get some uh, hybrid grasses in there that will utilize the, the moisture earlier in the spring uh, and then it'll hold through the summer into late fall. It just makes for a, a way to be able to use land that has traditionally never been used in cattle or any uh, type of production like that. And then I think what's interesting also is we'll see the wildlife just follow right into the, these same areas. So I think we're, we're, we're benefiting uh, the erosion problem, the production, we're helping production, we're helping wildlife. It's just an overall benefit all the way around to, to treating some of these grounds. Well, I think this is a great example of how this is going to be sustainable. This is a very sustainable system as we have it right now. Um, it has helped with um, holding back erosion. It has helped with um, any kind of water holding capacity. Um, the diversity of the above ground uh, plants also helps the diversity below ground in the soil biology and the soil health. So it's really helped create that whole system and a more holistic approach that's going to be long term um, um, a good thing. Conservation has long been a proud part of the Esplin's heritage and one they intend to carry on through their partnership with the Natural Resources Conservation Service. NRCS can help ranchers. Don't be afraid to, to work with them. They make it better. They're here to work hand in hand with you at, at making these ranching operations more sustainable and more productive and viable. So give it a whirl if you haven't tried it before because they will they will help you. I know in our our operation it's it's changed it's changed the way we do things for the better.
our relationship with the NRCS has been really beneficial to not only my father's generation, but, but our generation. And we have worked with them quite extensively. We seem to have a personal r relationship with our local people. And that's what I think is where uh, things really benefit. When we're able to know them personally, we can sit down at the table with them personally. We can go over a map and, and they know our ranch and we can say this is an area that we haven't gotten much use out of but we think there's great potential there. When you have that personal relationship then that's when good things can happen. NRCS of course wants farmers and ranchers to be successful. Um, it, you know, it's helping people help the land, and um, help by helping the land, you're helping people. We're a voluntary agency that um, helps with uh, private landowners uh, across the country, uh, develop conservation plans uh, with our technical assistance and with science-based tools and, and planning processes. So we actually have uh, most of our people are out in the field um, and in the counties helping plan and uh, working with ranchers and farmers uh, to do really the good science work. We work on working lands and that's really important to us to keep those lands sustainable um, and uh, working with conservation. It's just neat to, get, to just see the land blossom and to just see it improve. I don't know if there's any better feeling in the world to just look out and say, I made that better. And that's gonna be better for, a lot, for many generations. And, and so I, it's, it's, a, it's great to be a part of that. I wouldn't trade it for anything. Reporting from Mount Carmel in southwestern Utah, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. It's easy to get started on conservation planning. Just call your local NRCS office or visit the website nrcs.usda.gov to learn about the technical and financial assistance that NRCS can provide. Still ahead, we'll check in with a cowboy poet, Baxter Black. Plus, we head to Phoenix for a look at some of the exciting events planned for the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. Stay with us. Want more profit out of your pasture? Then here's our two cents on using parasite control to make some dollars. In a trial of calves, long range outperformed Cydectin and Safeguard dewormers combined by as much as an extra 40 pounds. Yeah, that's a lot of extra profit. And that's why it pays to treat cattle with long range. Do not treat within 48 days of slaughter. Not for use in female dairy cattle 20 months of age or older, including dry dairy cows or in veal calves. Post-injection site damage can occur. These reactions have disappeared without treatment. You can't afford another season without long range. No storm is too powerful for New Purina wind and rain storm minerals, formulated with ultimate weather resistance. That means more minerals in the feeder and available to your cattle. Wind and rain storm minerals provide more consistent intake and balanced mineral nutrition to optimize herd health and breed back rates. See the difference at your local Purina dealer or visit CattleNutrition.com. Wind and rain storm minerals, another way Purina is building better cattle. Each year, a huge crowd turns out for the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's a unique and fun environment for cattle industry members to come together to network, create policy for the industry, and to have some fun. And the good news is that convention registration is now open. We sent Russell Nemitz to Phoenix to find out more about this big event. Russell? Well, cattlemen and cattlewomen, it's time to pack your boots and get ready to join us here in sunny and beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. And let me tell you what, the people here in Phoenix are already getting ready for the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. And with us to tell us all the excitement and the exciting details about the event is Marvin Kokash from the NCBA. And, and Marvin, I meant what I said. This city is ready to have cattlemen and cattlewomen the end of January and February. 
we've been here several times planning for this convention and one thing that the city of phoenix has told me directly says marvin we are all in for the cattlemen uh, for the upcoming convention so they're excited we're excited this city has changed so much since the last time we had our convention here there's so much of a nightlife and a vibe and new restaurants and a lot of construction that's happened downtown since the last time cattlemen were here so we've got a lot of things to see and do here Okay, tell us about some of the highlights then as far as the convention for the, the cattle industry convention. Well, you know, we're known for our world-class trade show that we have. You know, we have six plus acres of trade show, but one of the great things about going to a warm city like Phoenix, uh, we've actually closed down Third Street, so we'll have great outdoor exhibits that'll be really special. And we can do some various things with outdoor space. We're gonna welcome Cattle in our opening general session with uh, some people that may know her as the pioneer woman, but her name's Reed Drummond. She's on the Food Network. She has uh, just been a tremendous uh, storyteller and recipe teller for the for the beef industry so we're really excited to have her uh, we have a gentleman a former professional baseball player by the name of jim abbott he's one of our uh, speakers for our convention and then uh, like we're known for too we we you know, cattlemen we like to have some fun so we have uh, bill ingvall going to come and entertain us on friday night along with a couple gentlemen from the show whose line is it anyway so it's gonna be an exciting time you know, as if there wasn't already enough to do at the convention itself, you know, the greater Phoenix area, there is quite a bit of agriculture outside of the city limits. I understand uh, there's going to be some fun events planned for outside of the convention area itself. You know, we're, we're not going to tell everybody our top secret news, but we are going to uh, take people to a very special place on a, for our Thursday night party. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, people will not be disappointed. Again, we've spent a lot of time planning and getting ready for these events. Uh, so it's it's going to be one of those uh, conventions you just can't miss. If you haven't been to Phoenix lately, come on back. This city has reinvented itself, and so we're really excited to be here. They sure have, and, and there's no time like the present, and folks can actually now get online or contact the office there in Denver and, and get signed up and join us here in Phoenix. Registration's open. Go to beefusa.org. Click on the old register for convention tab. We'd love to have you. Uh, we expect you know anywhere from seven to 9,000 people, but what the heck, let's go ahead and break the record, because we last year when we were in Nashville, we had a paltry 9,400 people. I think we can get up to 10,000. I think cattlemen, again, get out of the cold, come down to Phoenix, because it is hot. <laughs> it is hot. In fact, if you're come from a cold weather state or a region like I am out of Montana or Colorado or the Dakotas or Wyoming, there are worse places to be than here in Phoenix, Arizona. Again, it's the Cattle Industry Convention in CBA Trade Show headed for here in Phoenix, Arizona, the end of January, the 1st of February. There you go, Kevin. That's going to do it from here. We'll go ahead and send it back to you. Thanks, Russell. As Russell and Marvin just said, it'll be a hot time at the Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. We asked cattlemen and women from all across the country why they value coming to convention. I value coming to convention uh, for multiple reasons. Uh, one would be the opportunity to network with other individuals, a uh, chance to, to meet people and, and share similar issues and problems we may be facing, challenges, but at the same time, uh, uh, learning about each other's successes and the way that maybe we can uh, improve our operations. Plus we have the opportunity to, uh, to focus in and drill down on uh, specific issues so that we can create a, a greater voice for ourselves and a clear path um, when our voice is heard in Washington. The convention, the biggest part of it, going to convention every year, is actually the networking opportunities. I've met some great people, and so that helps us with our business going forward, just that networking piece that we were able to meet, and also just the information updates. I would say show up. That's the first step. If you show up, there are people around there that would like to show you around and like to say, hey, here's a committee over here where we can get you involved, or here's this group over here where we can get you involved. If you show up, then the people around you will get you involved and help you to connect, make friendships, make business contacts. The most important part is just showing up. I attend the cattle industry convention because it renews my faith in the beef industry and its producers. I learn things and I feel like I have a say in helping the beef industry chart its course in the future. 
It doesn't matter if you're a first-timer or a long-time convention attendee. We want to see you in Phoenix. The 2018 convention runs from January 31st through February 2nd. Go to BeefUSA.org for all the details on how to register for this can't-miss event. When we return, it's time for a visit with the cowboy poet Baxter Black. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Forward. It's more than a direction. It's mandatory. Because the beef business rewards the progressive, the doers, the ones who know what it takes to go easy on cattle and never set them back. So set your eyes on the horizon, turn your back to the wind, and move your herd the only way you know. Forward. Beast of vaccines. Always ahead. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. When a new calf hits the ground, his clock starts ticking. A belly full of colostrum gives him his best odds, but if he doesn't get any, his time starts running out. That's when you grab a bag of Oxford Ag Colostrum in their patented feeding system. Fill them with warm water, shake it to mix, feed it with a tube or nipple, and you are done! No bucket, no bottle, no mess, and right on time. Get yours at OxfordAg.com. Costs less than a dead calf. Have you ever heard a farmer say, my gosh, I'm going to be late for work? Not hardly. There's a different cadence to a farmer's life. They literally march to a different drummer. It's one of the great distinctions between urban and country. It's eight to five versus dawn to dusk. Town jobs out of a necessary sense of order revolve around a man-made schedule. Punch the clock. 40 hour a week, eight to five, time and a half. Well, those are alien concepts on the farm. Cows are up at the crack of dawn. Horses are in the pasture grazing as soon as it's light. Now granted, dogs might oversleep and cats always do, but they've had to adjust their breakfast time to ours. And farmers, like their animals, set their body clock on daylight and dark. Now on the job in town, we eat when it's noon. Not when we're hungry. We quit when it's five, not when we're tired. We don't traipse around the neighborhood begging for candy anytime we feel like it. We wait for October 31st. And when the evening whistle blows, we shut down the computer, turn out the lights and go home. Very convenient. But when nature is added to the equation, animals, weather, seasons, and the chaos that comes with it, the clock goes out the window. Ask anybody who farms and has a day job between waking up at 6 a.m., getting ready for work, going out to feed, checking the stock, getting the kids off to school, and then getting out of the house by 7.30, anything can happen. A fence is down and your cows are grazing in the bar ditch. A gate is left open and your horse is in the grain barrel. There are two dead sheep in the, in the lot surrounded by coyote tracks. A cow is calving. Somebody left the stock water running. The feed truck has a flat tire and you don't have time for this. You'll be late for work. In conclusion, if there is any blessing in living life on nature's dawn to dust schedule versus the eight to five town schedule, it's that farmers never have to worry about overtime. This is Baxter Black from out there. Thanks, Baxter. The hours can get long sometimes, but we love what we do. Don't forget the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show is just around the corner. We're on the lookout for a few good interns to help us blaze a trail to Phoenix. Interns will have a unique opportunity to gain experience within the cattle industry while networking with leaders from every segment of the beef industry. 
If you think you've got what it takes, you can visit beefusa.org for information on how to apply. We'll have more right after this. Stay with us. Say goodbye to your toughest pasture and rangeland weeds for good. Because one product offers season-long control, handles the widest spectrum of broadleaf weeds, and clears the way for increased forage with greater grazing flexibility. So you get more beef per acre at a cost that can't be beat. It's Grazon Next HL Herbicide. And if it's in your pastures, plain and simple, weeds won't be. Blaze a trail to Phoenix, Arizona and the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show. It's the cattle industry's biggest convention with education, networking, and fun. Plus, you can check out the huge NCBA Trade Show, outstanding entertainment, and more. Don't miss the 2018 Cattle Industry Convention and NCBA Trade Show in Phoenix, January 31st through February 2nd. Visit BeefUSA.org for more. Welcome back. Thousands have been hit hard by this year's hurricane season, including members of the beef industry, their livestock, and their crops. The cattle community is rallying to help those in need with a variety of support efforts. To find out how you can donate, go to the website beefusa.org. You'll find links to many responding agencies that are helping with the relief efforts. It's time, once again, for one of my favorite segments, Legacy Photos. Let's have another look at some great shots from farms and ranches from around our country. Want to see your photo on Cattleman to Cattleman? You can submit your favorite shots a couple of ways. Either message them to us on the Cattleman to Cattleman Facebook page, or you can email them to c2c at beef.org. Well, that's our time for this week's edition of NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Thanks so much for watching. I hope to see you again next week right here on RFD TV.